It is the single largest religion in the history of the world. For 2,000 years, Christianity has dominated the hearts, minds, and self-image of Western civilization. The story of Jesus is told every day in churches, homes, and cathedrals around the globe. Yet, there is another story not as well known. The story of the men and women behind the world's most powerful faith. This is the story, not of Christ, but of Christianity. The story of a religion that starts as a tiny Jerusalem sect and goes on to triumph over the world. Join us in exploring the extraordinary story of an extraordinary faith. The epic saga from the Last Supper to the First Millennium. The story of the rise of Christianity, the first thousand years. Jerusalem, 30 AD. The people of Israel are under the subjugation of the Roman Empire. Rome has replaced the Jewish king with a Roman governor. Attempts at rebellion are brutally quashed by the soldiers of the empire. A small group of devout Jews have gathered in Jerusalem to examine their shattered hopes and contemplate their dark future. The leader of their organization has just been executed for treason against Rome. Each man and woman in the sect may face the same fate. This is the state of mind of the people we have come to call the Christian apostles in the weeks after the death of Jesus of Nazareth. Scripture says there are 12 of them. Their new leader is a former fisherman who goes by the name Simon Peter. Simon Peter believes that his slain leader is the Messiah the savior of Israel. Yet the execution of Jesus is a shocking and unexpected conclusion to a promising ministry. Many of the group's followers, including Simon Peter, claim to have seen the risen Jesus mysteriously resurrected after his death and burial. Is this a sign that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the one who will save Israel, and that he has conquered death? Or is it a trick of the imagination, a devoutly wished for remedy for a catastrophic situation? Such are the concerns that occupy the minds of the apostles as they gather with others still loyal to Jesus to celebrate the Jewish Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks at the end of the grain harvest. It is 50 days after the execution of Jesus. The followers are about to experience a mysterious phenomenon, a phenomenon that will create from this small and frightened remnant 
a religion which will triumph over the known world. It is described in the New Testament in the book called The Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Acts of the Apostles 2, 1. Simon Peter then goes out and begins to speak to the throng of fellow Jews who had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Hebrew Pentecost. He puts forth a new spiritual message that will change the world. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. For the promise is for you and for your children and for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Acts 2, 36. Simon Peter's speech has an astonishing effect. The scriptures say that in that single day, the sect gained 3,000 new converts. From this day forward, the followers of Jesus are no longer a leaderless offshoot of mainstream Judaism. Something new has emerged. Christ is no longer among them, but a new religion has been born. The new converts to the message of Jesus join a dedicated and enthusiastic group devoted to communal living, sharing everything with each other for the common good. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all who had need. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number. Acts of the Apostles 2.44. From the beginning, the movement dedicates itself to carrying the message of Jesus throughout the world. Many of them sold everything they owned gave that money to a common pool that was managed by the apostles, and that money was used to finance evangelistic missionary trips by the apostles and others. And so you had from the uh, very first months after Christ's death, people heading out for Syria and for various parts of Palestine, and even shortly enough for Europe and other places. The followers of Jesus now face a dilemma. Who will lead the new church? Could anyone take the place of the resurrected Messiah? It is a question that will haunt the new religion for the next 2,000 years. Tradition states that Simon Peter was the leader of the first Christians. For Roman Catholics, Peter's status as Episcopus, or overseer of the apostles, is the same role that the Pope holds today. Yet before Peter ever became Bishop of Rome, he reported to an earlier leader of the Jesus movement. This was the Apostle James, the man that the Gospel refers to as the brother of the Lord. If you'd ask the question, who was the first bishop of the Christian church on earth? The answer would not be Simon Peter, as you might imagine. The first bishop of the church was James the Just of Jerusalem, who was Jesus' half-brother. The actual relationship between James and Jesus is a matter of debate. 
Some theologians have claimed that James was Joseph and Mary's younger son, or that he was Joseph's son from a previous marriage. Others have said that the term brother may not have indicated a blood relation. Whatever his connection to Jesus, James is generally agreed to be the leader of the Jesus movement in Jerusalem, both in scripture and in history. I did not set eyes on any of the rest of the apostles, only James, the brother of the Lord. I swear before God that what I have written is the truth. Galatians 1.18 James is often called the just or the righteous for his strict adherence to Orthodox Jewish law. Yet some followers of Jesus are beginning to question the importance of Jewish law. Already, the Jesus movement is breaking away from the traditional practices of Judaism. There were some things that the early Christians did, however, that would have shocked other Jews. And I think the first one that comes to my mind is the practice of, of what they call the, the, the Lord's Supper. That is, eating bread and drinking wine and speaking of these as if they were human flesh and human blood. This would be abhorrent to anyone who knows Jewish food laws in which, you know, eating food with blood in it is prohibited completely. So this would have shocked anyone who was Jewish. As the Jesus movement begins to break away from its roots, tensions begin to simmer with more traditional Jews. The followers of Jesus are becoming controversial, and controversy is about to provoke violence. The rupture begins with a man named Stephen. Stephen was filled with grace and power and began to work miracles and great signs among the people. Then certain people came forward to debate with Stephen. They found that they could not stand up against him because of his wisdom. So they put up false witnesses to say, this man is always making speeches against the temple and the law. Acts of the Apostles 6, 8. Stephen's eloquent preaching about Jesus the Messiah enrages the high priests of Jerusalem who arrest him and bring him before the Jewish court on charges of blasphemy. Stephen reviles the high priests to their faces. You, obstinate and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the Righteous One, and you, now living, have become his betrayers and murderers. Acts of the Apostles, 751. When Stephen got up and preached, he challenged the interpretations of the key symbols to Judaism, which were the Torah and the temple. And he was stoned for crimes against Judaism. Stephen is about to become Christianity's first martyr. When the crowd heard him, they became very angry and gritted their teeth with rage. And all rushed at him. They drove him out of the city and stoned him. Stoning is a group effort, Israel's traditional communal execution. Among the crowd watching the prolonged fatal agony is a young Jew known as Saul of Tarsus. As Stephen is executed before his approving eyes, Saul considers himself the new faith's worst enemy. But as destiny will have it, Saul will soon be transformed into the greatest champion that Christianity has ever known. Stephen has been stoned to death for blasphemy, 
at the command of the Jewish court. One of the crowd at Stephen's execution is a man named Saul. Born in the Roman town of Tarsus, in what is now Turkey, Saul becomes a vigorous champion of Jewish orthodoxy and a persecutor of the new Jesus heresy. That day, a severe persecution began against the church. Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. Acts of the Apostle 8.1 his job was to go and really put down and to persecute and to keep a lid on these fanatical followers of this Jesus of Nazareth because they were causing a great deal of dissension, a great deal of difficulty for the Jewish authorities, the religious authorities in Jerusalem. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Acts of the Apostles, 8-2. It is in this capacity, as a political and religious enforcer, that Saul experiences a transformation that echoes down to this day. The story is told in the Acts of the Apostles. As he was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul senses this is the voice of God. He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus. And in that statement, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is telling Paul, the Christians are me. They're my people. They're my body. They're my church. You're persecuting me. And Paul changes completely. Paul of Tarsus, first, last, and always, was zealous about anything he undertook. He was the best student around from Cilicia, if we can believe his report. He took on representatives from all the synagogues uh, in Jerusalem and, and Damascus and elsewhere uh, proclaiming the faith. And although he was a persecutor of the church to begin with, once he converted, that is, turned 180 degrees out of phase, he then becomes the most enthusiastic proponent of the faith. Thus Saul begins his journey of transformation. Saul is struck blind by his fall and is ministered to by a local follower of Jesus. His sight returns to him, and as the Christian Bible tells us, he begins to publicly proclaim the teachings of Jesus. However, Saul's astonishing claim of direct contact with the risen Christ is baffling to those apostles who suffered along with Jesus during his lifetime. To them, only one of the Messiah's inner circle could be described as an apostle. The status of the Apostle Paul was um, always in question in the early church. And the reason it was uh, in doubt is because he had not been a follower of Jesus and not known him during his lifetime. And those who did claimed the prerogatives that they thought didn't belong to Paul. So there was tension between Paul and the leaders of the Jerusalem church. The tension between Saul and the other apostles becomes moot as Saul takes his message to the world outside of Israel. He adopts a Romanized name, Paul, and sets out to bring the story of Jesus to non-Jews, the Gentiles of the Roman Empire. The pagan world of the first century is undergoing its own form of spiritual crisis. 
The period of time uh, for the early church and the years thereafter was a very interesting time for religion. A, a post-Olympian kind of period. The Olympian gods and goddesses that they had revered before did not have the same kind of value. People were casting about for new kinds of gods and goddesses, new sorts of beliefs that could capture their fancy and could give them hope and a reason for living beyond what uh, they found with the um, Olympian gods and goddesses. And so people looked internationally to Egypt and to Turkey and to the Middle East for new kinds of religions, new kinds of gods and goddesses. Many of the Gentiles Paul meets are already attracted to Judaism. They attend synagogue worship and even make sacrifices at the Jerusalem temple. The Jews call them God-fearers. They worship the Hebrew God, but have not completely converted to Judaism with the requisite circumcision and kosher dietary restrictions. Some of these God-fearers are among Paul's first converts to the teachings of Jesus. But the new apostle's mission rapidly extends beyond the God-fearers and beyond the confines of Jerusalem. Paul's mission to the Gentile world is perhaps the most revolutionary undertaking in the history of Christianity. Wherever he goes, Paul tailors his preaching to appeal to each new audience. He frankly states in one of his letters that he is attempting to be all things to all men. Paul brings the message of Jesus north to the Syrian city of Antioch. Here the word Christian is first used to describe the new sect and to distinguish it from Judaism. Paul changes the name of his master from the Hebrew Yeshua, a modified form of the name Joshua, to the Greek Iesus. And he translates the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah, meaning anointed by God, to the Greek, Christos. Paul now travels west by foot, by caravan, and by ship. He makes his way through Asia Minor into Greece and finally to Rome itself, capital of the empire and center of the Gentile world. He was really good at winning over the Gentiles because he was born in Tarsus, and so he knew the Gentile world. He knew what phrases to use in terms of their logic and how to communicate to them and how to win them over. He always carefully in his sermons began where his hearers were, and then he drew them out in the direction toward Christianity that he wanted to uh, bring them along. And so it's a, it's a masterpiece, I think, of uh, sermon skills, pastoral skills, approach, uh, forensic abilities, uh, and uh, combining with his own natural immense intellect. Uh, he could bring it off. As Paul travels throughout the Mediterranean, he writes letters of advice and instruction to the various churches he has founded. These letters are the first Christian scriptures predating the writing of the Gospels by decades. But a crisis is now brewing in Jerusalem. Some claim that Paul's mission to the Gentiles has been so accommodating that it has betrayed the origins of the movement. In preaching to the Gentiles, some fear that Paul has forgotten Judaism. Very often Christians will think what happened between Christianity and Judaism, insofar as those two religions eventually split, was that some Jews believed Jesus was the Messiah, other Jews would not, and so the big split was over the Messiahship of Jesus. That is almost totally wrong. What the split is over is the attitude towards God's law. Can we begin to decide there are parts of God's law that can be left aside? Paul has told the Gentile converts that they need not follow kosher rules for eating. Not everyone agrees.
in Jerusalem. Some Christians insist that converts to the sect must follow the full extent of the Jewish law. To resolve this question, James convenes the first apostolic council in Jerusalem in 49 AD. The results of this conference of Christians will determine the entire future of the new faith. The church had to decide how do you become a Christian if, for example, you're a Gentile? Do you have to become a Jew first? The Apostolic Council said no Gentiles can come directly into Christianity. And that decision was of enormous importance for the future of the church. Paul has come to an understanding with the traditionalists among the Christians in Jerusalem, but he's made himself unpopular among observant Jews. A group of Jews from Asia Minor stirs up the local populace against Paul, accusing him of profaning the Jerusalem temple. Only the intervention of a Roman tribune keeps Paul from being killed by the angry mob. Paul is imprisoned while the Jewish high court prepares to prosecute him. Paul invokes his rights as a Roman citizen, inherited from his father, to a trial in Rome. He is taken under guard on a ship bound for the capital. As Paul approaches the mighty gates of Rome, one can only imagine his feelings as he prepares to tell the world's most powerful city that it has just killed the Messiah. Paul remains under arrest for the next five years, but his power of persuasion is so strong that even incarcerated, this is one of his most productive periods. The movement that started on the Pentecost following the crucifixion had already changed radically in its first 30 years. Once a small and unpopular cult, it has become a new faith. Once a Jewish sect, it has become a Greco-Roman religion. The entourage of an executed rebel has been expanded to include throngs of dedicated converts from across the known world. But a deadly backlash is about to set in. A backlash from the Roman world, which Christianity has so eagerly sought to win over. The new faith is about to suffer the wrath of an angry empire. The sudden expansion of Christianity in the latter part of the first century is an astonishing success story. It was explosive in the way that it spread. Christianity went everywhere uh, suddenly, and it seemed like the whole Mediterranean basin, the whole Roman Empire, within a number of decades was uh, hearing the good news of Christ. Within one generation, the center of Christianity has moved from Jerusalem to Rome. Rome is, after all, the center of the empire. In approximately 60 AD, Paul the Apostle arrives in Rome. Simon Peter, leader of the apostles during Jesus' lifetime, also comes to Rome to bring Christianity to the capital. But the message of Jesus will bring death to some. Christians are often executed for their beliefs. The Roman historian Tacitus describes the dangerous reputation of this new cult from Judea. Hated for their evil practices were the group popularly known as Christians. Their deadly superstition was beginning to spring up with all kinds of sordid and shameful activities. Cornelius Tacitus, 100 AD. As Roman society 
became slowly aware of this new religion um, forming in its midst, there was a lot of anxiety about it. And it was fanned by rumors that Christians practiced cannibalism, incest, ate babies baked in loaves of bread. So you, you get a sense of you know, the way in which cults are talked about. Well, this is the way that Roman society was in these early years perceiving Christianity. But the backlash against Christianity goes further than simply lurid rumors. When the authorities, especially the Roman authorities, started to look at Christianity, they made two accusations against it. First of all, you're atheists. That may strike us as a strange thing, but they meant you do not worship the gods that all the rest of us do. And so you're atheists. And the second accusation was you hate the human race. Again, sounds very strange to us, but this was an, an actual accusation because you, you won't do what the rest of us does. If we, for example, have in our city a celebration of the patron god of our, our goddess of our city and everyone is out feasting in the streets and going to the temple, you people won't come out and play with the gods, as it were. That's like somebody not standing up for the national anthem at a baseball game. If that happens too often, you can have a riot. Roman suspicion of Christianity turns to outright hostility with a single disaster, a catastrophe that nearly destroys the eternal city. It was the worst fire Rome ever had. It burns on for nine or 10 days. And after it's over, people aren't gonna believe it was accidental. No one knows how the fire began. But many Romans blame the devastation on their corrupt emperor, Nero. Nero, in turn, blames the disaster on Christian arsonists. He begins an official persecution against Christians, arresting, torturing, and executing them. Here is how the Roman writer Tacitus remembers the scenes of dying martyrs. In their deaths, they were made a mockery. They were covered in skins of wild animals, torn to death by dogs, crucified or set on fire, so that when darkness fell, they burned like torches in the night. It is one of the darkest periods in Christian history. Crucifixions and beheadings give way to public executions in the Colosseum, where Christians are often attacked by wild animals or forced to fight gladiators for the amusement of the crowd. Roman persecutors attempt to destroy the new faith by eliminating the most important Christians. What the Roman Empire did was pick the leaders. It made a very clear, there's us and there's them. There's the martyrs, and there's the murderers. And in a way, it put paganism and Christianity clearly at odds with one another. Ironically, the Roman strategy only seems to strengthen the new religion. One account describes the effect of persecutions by saying, the blood of the martyrs is seed for the new faith. Paul of Tarsus, who has been under house arrest in Rome, is beheaded by the authorities. Simon Peter is publicly crucified by the Romans in the same period. It is said that feeling himself unworthy of the same death as his master Jesus, Peter asked to be crucified upside down. In addition, 
the Jerusalem church under the leadership of James has been wiped out. James was thrown to his death from the Temple Mount by Roman soldiers in 62 AD. A full-scale Jewish rebellion breaks out the following year. Roman legions descend upon the city of Jerusalem and burn it to the ground in 70 AD. The Jewish temple is destroyed. The Jewish people are subjugated. The homeland of Jesus will no longer be the homeland of Christianity. And so it continues for the next hundred years. Christians attempt to spread the word of Jesus while Romans sporadically persecute and kill them. One tradition has it that Christianity survived this dark period by going underground, literally underground. These are the catacombs, family tombs that snake beneath the street outside the ancient walls of Rome. The catacombs are the site of the first Christian churches in the capital of the empire. Until recently, it was thought that the catacombs were a secret sanctuary for persecuted Christians. Yet modern scholars have discovered that the catacombs were not used only by Christians. In fact, the underground tombs were the traditional place of burial for Roman pagans. People celebrated a meal together with their dead in the, in the Roman catacombs. I'm not talking about Christians, I'm talking about pagans. The spirit, as it were, of the person who had died hovered near the place where they were buried. And so you could actually eat with them. You could even pour a small libation of the wine and they would, as it were, be part of the picnic. The catacomb churches, far from being places of refuge, are actually an attempt to integrate Roman customs into the evolving forms of Christian worship. As Christian practices become more Roman in style, the persecutions begin to diminish. The new religion grows. Yet, as the faith evolves and changes, Factions within Christianity begin to challenge each other. New forms of worship emerge, each insisting on its own orthodoxy. As the danger of Roman persecution begins to fade, the equally severe danger of factionalism threatens to tear apart the Christian religion. It is 200 years after the execution of Jesus Christianity has expanded to nearly every corner of the Roman Empire. Each region has their own religious customs associated with the Christian faith. Yet all churches share one ritual in common, a communal meal. We sometimes forget when we look at the Eucharist in the Christian church today, which is a sort of a symbolic meal, that the Eucharist in those Christian communities was a real meal. People like myself, who are fairly well fed and who don't think very often about where the next meal is coming from, find it very difficult, I think, to imagine that people seriously thought about heaven as a banquet. Wow, what enough food. Or that the Eucharist is a real meal. God comes to us as food. But it wasn't the theology that came first was the food. The Christian communal meal is usually held in the home. This leads to a power structure in the early church entirely different from the one we have today. For often early Christian churches were led by women. House churches were 
presided over by the householder, which could be the father of the household or the mother of the household. The household really was considered woman's domain. So in the house churches, we're in a social space that recognizes and is quite comfortable with women's authority. Women leaders are part of the wide diversity that marks early Christianity. Rituals and customs may vary from city to city and country to country, yet as Christianity grows, this diversity is increasingly seen as a threat. Christianity is still persecuted throughout the empire, and many Christians feel that a united front is needed if the new religion is to survive. At the forefront of this movement is Ignatius of Antioch. In the year 110 AD, he is arrested during a persecution of Christians. As he is transported across Asia Minor to Rome to be executed, he meets with members of local Christian churches along the way. Ignatius, like Paul, is one of the key figures in early Christianity. He's working to centralize the authority over Christians in a town under a single person. There's a move to consolidate all of those little house churches into one larger organization. One of the movers in this direction was to bring a central authority to this collection of house churches in the form of a bishop. Ignatius proposes a structure for the church based on Roman city government. The Christian congregation becomes the Roman city and the bishop becomes the Roman administrator. In this way, every early church comes to resemble a Roman municipality in the empire of Christianity. In letters to the churches he visits, Ignatius sets forth his design for a centralized Christianity. You should all follow the bishop as Jesus Christ did the Father. Follow to the elders as you would the apostles, and respect the deacons as you would God's law. He who pays the bishop honor has been honored by God. But he who acts without the bishop's knowledge is in the devil's service. Ignatius of Antioch, 110 AD. The spread of Christianity has followed the roots of the apostles from city to city. This urban religion will now be governed by the civic standards of the most powerful city in the world, Imperial Rome. Women now lose the power they had achieved in the early church. Rome does not generally permit women to hold leadership positions. Christianity will demote them accordingly. The influence of Roman culture has a profound effect on Christian thinking. Early Christian writers and teachers, like Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen, apply classical logic and philosophy to formulate what they believe is a definitive theology for Christianity. The fourth century AD is known as the golden age of Christian theology. The theologian Tertullian explains his faith eloquently to Roman philosophers. God made this universe by his word, reason, and power. Your philosophers also agree that the maker of the universe seems to be the logos, that is, word and reason. This word, we have learned, was produced by God and therefore is called the Son of God. Theology is essentially the use of philosophy to try to understand God. And after the year uh, 200, it became very clear that Christian thinkers were going to use Greek philosophy to try to establish the truth about God. Now, that means that the truth about God becomes almost as important and sometimes practically more important than the actual worship of, love of, practice of the religion. 
the new faith emphasizes more than just an intellectual theology. It offers community and mutual support in a rapidly changing Roman Empire. It is an anchor of faith and community in a shifting world. This was an encounter with ultimate reality in the person of God who was living with them. There was an appeal to Christian faith that still exists today. The appeal of the truth and love being put together in a wonderful package where it's believable and it's convincing and on the other hand it makes you a different person. And lots of people saw that and said, I like that. I like that. Uh, tell me more about it. This sounds good. The new faith makes inroads into the entire population of the empire, from slaves and peasants to the empire's middle classes to some Roman senatorial families. There were enormous changes taking place within Christian communities. Um, Christianity was now penetrating into the upper classes. The leadership of the churches came more and more from the municipal elites. The organization of the church is much more like the city council. The Christian communities are seeing themselves much more as, a, um, as an independent community, almost as a political entity. Christianity bought into the political and social status quo. Without this kind of concern for political power, it is not clear that Christianity would have survived. But what is intriguing and fascinating and provocative about this is, at what price did it buy into this power? At what cost did it buy into hierarchy? At what cost did it compromise some of the values of Jesus in order to be successful as a religion? Just as Christianity is experiencing its greatest growth, it is about to experience its worst persecution. In 303 AD, Roman Emperor Diocletian claims that the sun god Apollo has spoken to him. According to Diocletian, Apollo is angry at the rise of this new Christian deity in Rome, and so begins a deadly crusade against Christianity. It intended to do nothing less than destroy the new religion. To eliminate every Christian in the Mediterranean world, a final solution for Christians. And yet, within a decade of what will come to be known as the Great Persecution, Christianity will become the dominant religion of the entire Roman Empire. What caused this extraordinary, even miraculous turnabout? How did this tiny Jewish sect from the backwater of the empire come to dominate Rome, the Mediterranean, and all of Europe? The rise of Christianity is one of the most startling success stories in history. In less than 300 years, Christianity has spread from an obscure corner of Palestine through the entire Roman Empire. Despite centuries of persecution and repression, Christianity has not only survived, it has flourished. Now, 300 years after the death of Jesus, the Christian church faces ultimate destruction from a vengeful new emperor. But the new faith will soon turn the tables on its oppressors. Christianity is about to conquer the Roman Empire itself. In the first years of the third century, the Roman Empire is in a state of chaos. Political crises, barbarian invasions, and drastic economic troubles nearly bring about the collapse of the Roman Empire. Political infighting becomes deadly. There have been 22 emperors in 50 years, and 20 of them have died violently. In 285 AD, 
the Emperor Diocletian takes command and reorganizes the entire empire on a military basis. He splits the sprawling empire into eastern and western halves in an attempt to prevent his rivals from rising against him. The division of the empire seems to create more problems than it solves. Diocletian set up what's called the Tetrarchy. There were now going to be two emperors, a western emperor and an eastern emperor. They'd be called Augustus or Augusti. Each of them would have under them a, an heir apparent called the Caesar. So you had two and two. Now you can imagine the possibilities for conflict. The Augusti could go for one another, or the Caesar could go for the Augustus. So the Tetrarchy was a very dangerous, unstable situation. On the religious front, Diocletian creates another equally dangerous situation by renewing the vigorous persecution of Christians. In 312 AD, the unstable power structure of the divided empire collapses. Constantine, a former soldier, is named Caesar of the West. He is assigned to the furthest reach of the empire, the English city of York. It is from here that Constantine makes his fateful bid for power. With his legions, he marches south across the European continent, intent on overthrowing the emperor. Eight miles outside Rome, at the Milvian Bridge, Constantine pauses. It is the eve of what will be the greatest battle of his life, the fight for control of the empire. It is precisely at this point that the would-be emperor has a vision. It is an apparition that will change Constantine's life and the life of all Europe for the next 1,700 years. Looking up in the sky, Constantine sees the sign of the cross on the face of the sun. Up until this time, Constantine has been a traditional pagan, worshiping the gods of Rome. Now he is confronted with the miraculous symbol of the forbidden Christian religion. At the same time, he hears an awesome voice announce his destiny. And then he hears the voice say to him, you are to conquer in this sign. And so he realizes that it's through Christ that he's going to win this battle. The battle is completely successful. They beat the opponent. He is established as the sole emperor of the western part of the empire. And ever after that, he's a Christian. And so it was that the tiny sect of a Jerusalem rebel conquers the Roman Empire. The conversion of Constantine is one of the most important turning points in Christian history. Constantine immediately rewards his newly embraced religion by issuing the Edict of Milan, declaring official tolerance for Christianity throughout the empire. The Roman persecutions are over forever. In 323 AD, Constantine marches against the Eastern Augustus, the pagan Licinius, and defeats him after two years of war. Constantine is now the sole ruler of both East and West. The ceremonies to celebrate the reunification of the empire are Christian. Yet 
the nature and extent of Constantine's conversion are still matters of debate. Modern scholarship suggests a complicated scenario behind the traditional version of history's greatest conversion. Some scholars claim that the God Constantine accepted that day at the Milvian Bridge was not Jesus, but the sun god Apollo. Could the reputed first Christian emperor have actually retained his paganism? He believed in the sun god, the Sol Invictus, the invincible uh, sun. He had some connection with Apollo and the idea of sun worship. And I think he was a man of his own spirituality, still evolving, still developing. Despite his ostensible conversion, Constantine retains many pagan practices when he becomes emperor. His sympathy with Christianity is undeniable, but so is his tolerance for paganism. His coins carry the image of the sun god. Constantine demands that Christians change their day of worship from the Hebrew Sabbath to the Roman Day of the Sun. And it is a matter of record that Constantine will not be baptized a Christian until he is on his deathbed. The question remains to this day, was Constantine truly a convert to Christianity, or was he simply a shrewd pagan politician who embraced a powerful minority? Perhaps the answer lies somewhere in between. There must have been in Constantine's mind an ideal of a unified empire. Wouldn't it be marvelous if you had one empire, one emperor, east and west, who could control the whole thing? Now, on the other hand, there is over here a religion, a huge institutionalized religion, which has withstood persecution, which is empire-wide, which has one God, as it were, one Christ, one baptism. And I think in Constantine's own imagination, those two things come together. Of course, there is one God, and there is one Christ, as there should be one emperor, and one emperor. One emperor? One empire, one dominant faith. Constantine and Christianity serve each other well. In less than 25 years, Christianity has made a dramatic transition from persecution to preeminence. In this sign, Constantine had indeed conquered. But now that Christianity held an empire, new beliefs and doctrines were appearing to trouble the faithful. Nearly 300 years after the death of Jesus, the first Christian Bible is about to be completed, and it will bring with it an entirely new set of troubles to the world of Christendom. Some of the third century's most devout followers of Jesus would not be recognized as Christians today. Many of the more mystical beliefs and factions within early Christianity are today called Gnostic, referring to the Greek word for secret knowledge. The earliest members were called Gnostics, who had this wild alternative theology to Christianity, which had all kinds of secret recondite formulas about uh, a great mother goddess who was in charge of uh, the God of the Old Testament proceeded from her, and a secret uh, series of ritual initiations would get you to this higher gnosis or knowledge. The Gnostic Christians derive their beliefs from such diverse sources as Greek philosophy, Egyptian and Babylonian mythology, and Zoroastrian theology imported from Persia. Their variations on Christian theology are often both imaginative and ingenious. A Gnostic congregation flourishes under Basilides, Bishop of Alexandria in the early second century. 
Thessalonians teaches that the world was created by a blind and insane angel named Abraxas, who believed himself to be God. According to Basilides, Jesus was sent to redeem humanity from this tyrannical spirit and did so, astonishingly, by escaping from the cross. The Gnostic story of Christ cheating the cross will resurface centuries later in the holy book of another faith, the Quran of Islam. Even the Gospels of the Gnostic sects differ radically from the scriptures that have come down to us today. From the Gnostic Gospel of the Egyptians comes this portrayal of an androgynous god. She became the womb of everything, for it is she who is prior to them all. The mother father, the first man, the Holy Spirit, the thrice male, the thrice powerful, the thrice named androgynous one, and the eternal eon among the invisible ones. One Gnostic gospel discovered in 1945 may well be older than the four traditional gospels of the Christian New Testament. The Gospel of Thomas is a collection of Jesus' sayings supposedly written by the apostle. From the Gospel of Thomas comes a hauntingly beautiful passage, perhaps more akin to Eastern philosophy than Judeo-Christian tradition. The disciples asked, when will the kingdom come? Jesus replied, the kingdom will not come by watching for it. It will not be said, look here or look there. Rather, the kingdom of heaven is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. We can look at these so-called apocryphal texts and find out a great deal, too, about early Christianity. In fact, some of these apocryphal Christian texts are just as precious and perhaps even more precious than the materials that we have in the New Testament because they show us the incredible variety that existed in early Christianity. But this diversity is also seen as a threat. Constantine, with his vision of one empire and one Christ, decides that it is time for one church and one Bible. The place, Nicaea, in present-day Turkey. The time, 325 AD, one year after Constantine assumes command over the entire reunited empire. The occasion, a meeting of bishops to agree upon a date for the celebration of Easter. Constantine takes a convention of clerical bureaucrats and transforms it into perhaps the single most important meeting in Christian history. For it is here at Nicaea that Christianity will develop an official statement of faith, a creed which will forever set forth the definition of Christianity. It's very difficult to imagine what the bishops must have thought when they were invited or commanded to come to Nicaea. This was within 25 years of the worst persecution possibly the church had ever undergone. And now they were being invited or commanded to come to a very nice place, Nicaea, with the emperor paying for all the costs of transportation and living while they were there, to have a conference with the emperor there with them sitting down among them. It must have been unbelievable if you can imagine bishops who had undergone persecution and survived persecution. The immediate concern of Constantine and his Christian advisors is the basic nature of Jesus and of God. There was a huge problem with how exactly was Jesus related to God. If you said he was divine and human, what did you mean? Was it like the God appearing in human flesh, but not a real body, or were you saying he was half and half? That was really the question that was going to be debated. 
Christian doctrine holds that God exists as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the idea of a single God in three persons is a sophisticated and complex concept that, at Nicaea, creates many conflicting opinions. A priest named Arius teaches that because Jesus is called the Son of God, he cannot be equal and identical to God the Father. Arius portrays Jesus as more than man, but less than God. The chief opponent of Arius is Athanasius, a North African bishop who insists that God the Father is identical with God the Son, two beings who are one in substance. The bishops at the Council of Nicaea wrestle over a definitive interpretation of the Trinity. Their heated arguments often revolve around the most infinitesimal details the Greek term was very important, homo usios, of the same substance as God. And Arius had said, no, he's homo usios, like the substance of God. And so the whole discussion hinged around one Greek letter, the iota. The Council of Nicaea's final decision by a vote of 300 to 3 is that Jesus is of the same substance as God. Arius loses. The concept of the Trinity triumphs. To make the matter absolutely clear, the bishops of the council create a creed or oath to which they expect all Christians to adhere. The Nicene Creed, created in the hot summer of seaside Nicaea in 325 AD, has been repeated every day since then in Christian churches all over the world. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, Son of the Father before all ages, one in being with the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. The church has conquered the heresy of Arius and created a confession of faith. It now turns its attention to the written word of God. Prior to this time, there has been no accepted Christian Bible. Each congregation and community throughout the empire had its own collection of holy books. Amongst these, and not only the traditional scriptures, but Gnostic gospels and such texts as the Revelation of Peter, the letters of Clement, and the book of advice and ethics called the Shepherd of Hermas. Nobody is writing the New Testament. That's a process. It, it takes place over a long period of time. There's no one moment you can say, it's done now. There are fringe ones like the Shepherd of Hermas that could be in for some churches, out for other churches. I suppose the absolute moment when the die is cast is when Constantine says, I'm going to subsidize 50 huge Bibles. Nobody will say to Constantine, well, we haven't quite decided yet what's in and out. You say, yes, and then you decide. And at that moment, Clement, is it out, the shepherd of Hermas is out, and your decision is made. And that's really the last step in the closing down of the canon of the New Testament. In 367 AD, Athanasius, the hero of Nicaea, lists the contents of the Christian Bible. It contains 27 documents from the first verse of Matthew to the last sentence of Revelation, the same 27 documents that today we call the New Testament. Three centuries after the death of Jesus, 
Christianity now has a creed, a Bible, and an empire. Yet far from the imperial bustle of the Roman capital, Christianity is continuing to evolve. The faith of Jesus is about to be transformed by the rugged and austere life of solitary monks living in the deserts and caves of Egypt. Once the Roman emperor becomes Christian, the Roman Empire soon follows. Within a generation of Constantine, Christianity has taken on the trappings and structure of a powerful organized religion. But within Christianity itself, a backlash begins to develop. Spurning power and comfort, a new breed of Christian seeks hardship and deprivation, refusing companionship and the rewards of the world the new breed seeks solitude and austerity. This new breed of Christian is called the monk. The word monk means a single one. It means a single person. And a monk was one who gave up married life, gave up family life, gave up parental expectations, and went out seeking God alone. Just as Jesus went out alone into the desert to face his demons, so too did the monks to face their own demons and to rediscover the essence of their faith. The great movement begins in the fourth century when monasticism arises as a reaction to the comfortable power of the new Christian elite. The monastic movement is perhaps best exemplified by the career of Anthony of Egypt. Forsaking his home, his family, and his farm, Anthony goes out into the deserts of Egypt and attempts direct communication with God. Anthony is revered by monastics today as one of the founders of the ascetic movement, as one of the great, the great monachoi, the monks. Anthony lived among the cemeteries for about 10 years, uh, slept out among the tombs in, in desert places in a radical search for God. The worst aspect of monastic life, according to St. Anthony, are the frightening physical attacks by demons. Demonic hallucinations may have been the psychological result of exposure to the elements, hunger, and prolonged solitude. Yet Anthony welcomes even the most terrifying demonic attacks as yet another modification of the flesh for the greater glory of God. There's a tradition uh, in the Eastern Church that the monks say that all you need to know will be taught to you in your own cell. The cell becomes your teacher, the monastic cell, the monastic retreat, uh, your living space. But through that fire of repentance, that transformative fire, literally both of the desert geographically and the desert of unchartered spiritual territory, he was purified and he was so attuned to the spirit that he attracted many, many, many followers who wanted to imitate him. It is ironic that the man who fled civilization for God becomes a leader of hundreds of would-be hermits who form a community around him. The daily routine of the Christian hermit is simple, prayer, meditation, and fasting. Other mortifications of the flesh are not uncommon. Some monks wall themselves alive in caves, Some spend their entire lives in trees. One monk, Simon Stylites, lives for 35 years at the top of a narrow pillar outside Alexandria. He is ultimately canonized by the Catholic Church. The way of the solitary monk eventually is superseded by a more organized, cooperative form of religious life 
as large monasteries spread throughout Egypt, Syria, and the Mediterranean. The self-denial of the monastic movement, especially its emphasis on celibacy, will strongly influence Christian morals and mores from the fifth century onward. The most admired expression of Christianity, Christianity at its most sterling, was the Christianity practiced by the ascetics. So if we think about it, if the highest form of Christianity is ascetic Christianity, which means the renunciation of sexuality, then what that means in principle is that sexuality is incompatible with spirituality that you have to choose, that the two are poised over against each other as adversaries. No one better exemplifies the battle between sensuality and asceticism than Augustine. Born in Hippo, a city in what is now Algeria, Augustine is perhaps the most renowned theologian in the 20 centuries of Christian history. His books, The Confession, and the City of God are powerful and personal stories of an individual's spiritual journey. The Confession, written in 400 AD, has been so powerful to readers over the centuries because Augustine confesses everything from sins of theology to his many, many sins of the flesh. He lived what we would call a dissolute life. His mother was a Christian, his father was not. He agonized over which direction his life should take. There were times when he'd have strong religious impulses. There were times when he didn't. He had trouble controlling his sexuality. Because my will was perverse, it changed to lust. And lust yielded to became habit. And habit unresisted became necessity. Thus I came to understand how the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. But Augustine is more than just a sexual libertine. He is also an educated intellectual. He studies metaphysics, Greek philosophy, and the theories of Plato. He experiments with mysticism and a Gnostic religion from Persia. Yet throughout his pursuit of philosophical truth, Augustine is equally absorbed by his pursuit of sexual pleasure. The tension between the two poles of philosophy and sensuality is resolved one day in a garden in Milan. I was still enslaved by my sins, weeping all the while with the most bitter sorrow in my heart when all at once I heard the sing-song voice of a child in a nearby house. Again and again, it repeated the chorus, take it and read, take it and read. I seized the book containing Paul's letters and opened it. In silence, I read the first passage on which my eyes fell. The passage that Augustine opens to is from the letter of Paul to the Romans. No orgies or drunkenness, no immorality or indecency, no fighting or jealousy. Take up the weapons of the Lord Jesus Christ and stop giving attention to your sinful nature to satisfy its desires. The hard living Augustine is baptized as a Christian side by side with his illegitimate son on Easter day of the year 387. He becomes a priest, then a bishop, applying his immense intellect to craft powerful written arguments for the Christian faith. It's fascinating to note that probably the most quoted theologian outside of St. Paul himself, 
in all of Christendom was St. Augustine, particularly in the Western Church. All the medieval theologians and the, the Reformation theologians like Martin Luther will quote Augustine more than any other church father. It was his theology that captured the center stream of Western Christendom and has so to the present day yet. So his gifts to the church are incalculable. Like many reformed transgressors, Augustine makes his formerly promiscuous lifestyle the focus of a theological assault. Augustine, in his Confessions, gives us these um, sometimes moving, sometimes shocking details of his sexual evolution. But we must remember that he has a definite strategy in writing his Confessions because he is a, he's now become an apologist for the life of chastity and therefore sees his sexuality as the greatest of all enemies and will make a lurid example of himself for the sake of his theology. When Augustine dies in 430 A.D., the former drunkard and libertine is generally acknowledged as the holiest man in Christendom. The great sinner had become a saint. But while Augustine constructs a new Christian theology in North Africa, across the Mediterranean, the capital of Christendom faces disaster. The eastern and western halves of the empire are splitting into venomous political factions. And outside the walls of Rome, a barbarian horde has begun to gather. By the fifth century, Rome is no longer the first city of the empire. Constantine has moved his capital east, creating a new city on the ruins of the ancient town of Byzantium. Constantinople, as it is called, boasts the finest natural harbor in the Mediterranean and commands the Straits of the Dardanelles, where Asia meets Europe. There is no finer setting for the new capital of a vast, sprawling empire. While Constantinople takes its place as a world capital, Rome enters into a period of decline, neglect, and unprecedented vulnerability. Slowly, much of the Senate and many of the titled uh, nobility of old Rome began to move to this area, and Rome was beginning to fall into decay. Germanic tribes began to start to break into what was called the old Roman Empire. And so, little by little, Rome, ancient Rome, was beginning to be abandoned. For the past three centuries, Rome has been defending her borders against the nomadic European tribes from the north. They call themselves Goths, Alans, Vandals, Swaves, and Franks. The Romans simply call them barbarians. Rome has wealth, civilization, and vast resources. The northern tribes want what Rome has. As the legions of the empire move east, Rome sees the barbarians moving closer. In the year 410, a tribe of Visigoths reaches the gates of Rome. The city is sacked, the citizens butchered, the disaster shocks the entire world. Remember, the Roman Empire is viewed as the manifestation of God's kingdom on earth. Therefore, if that empire falls, it's, it's sort of inconceivable. It wrecks your whole view of Christianity. Again and again, Germanic invaders attacked the gates of Rome. The Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals. Again and again, the gates fall before them. Who will stand up to the barbarians?
Unlikely as it seems, the job will fall to the Bishop of Rome. In the year 440 AD, Rome elects a new bishop. His name is Leo, son of Quintianus, and his brilliant career as a diplomat for both church and empire has prepared him well for his new holy office. Leo I will step into the power vacuum created by the migration to the Eastern Empire. When Leo assumes the papal throne, a century after the founding of Constantinople, the Roman Empire has once again essentially become two separate nations, East and West, split along the lines created by Diocletian 150 years earlier. One important difference is language. The eastern half of the empire speaks Greek. The western half speaks Latin. Later there is going to be an exaggeration of these cultural differences, and then there are going to be theological differences as well. The Patriarch of Constantinople felt that he was right on a par with the Bishop of Rome, but the Bishop of Rome didn't agree to that. And so there are going to be these tensions developing also in terms of personality factors. The word Pope, in Latin, Papa, literally means father. The term originally does not refer to the head of the church, but is applied by early Christians in North Africa to describe their local bishop. But in 440 AD, Leo I insists that one bishop has authority over all others. The leader of Christianity should be the man who holds the office once given to St. Peter by Jesus when he said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. This doctrine does not sit well with the bishop in Constantinople, who has the ear of the emperor. What the patriarch in Constantinople is saying is, I am the most important of all the Christian bishops, because I am here at the center of the Roman Empire, and I have the authority of the emperor with me. What the Pope in Rome for the first time is now saying uh, fairly clearly is, wait a minute, I am the successor of St. Peter, and it's Rome where Peter was first bishop that has the primacy of the church over the patriarch. Leo's aim in asserting the primacy of Rome is to reinforce church unity. Ironically, he begins a process that will eventually tear the one holy universal church in two. But Leo is facing a more pressing problem. It is the year 452, and all of Rome shudders in anticipation of an attack by the most fearsome barbarian in history. Attila the Hun. Attila is called the Scourge of God. He and his army have laid waste to Eastern Europe, from Macedonia to Greece to Northern Italy. Attila's army makes camp a few miles outside Rome, preparing for the final assault. At nightfall, the barbarian sentries notice a lone figure approaching the camp from the besieged city. It is Leo, the Pope of Rome, who has come alone to stop the scourge of God. A medieval chronicler writes, And lo, suddenly there were seen the apostles Peter and Paul clad like bishops, standing by Leo. They held swords outstretched, and they threatened Attila with death if he did not obey the Pope's command. Whether or not this vision actually occurred, the fact remains that after encountering the remarkable Leo I, 
Attila immediately renounces his plan to sack Rome and withdraws his barbarian army from Italy. Leo again negotiates peace with barbarians three years later, when Rome is looted for 14 days by the tribe of Vandals. Leo manages to extract a guarantee that the lives of the Roman people will be spared. The Roman legions can no longer protect the city, but Leo can. By the time of Leo's death in 461 AD, there is little left for the Western Roman Empire or its armies, but in its place stands a newly developing power structure, the papacy. Shortly thereafter, the last Roman emperor is removed from the throne to be replaced by the king of the Goths. Finally, it was only a matter of the final decision by uh, a Roman general named Odovacar who finally said, why do we keep this charade going called the Roman Empire? And he deposed the last Roman emperor, who was a kid named Romulus Augustulus, of all things, in the year 476 AD, and so he took over. And that is the famous sacred date for the fall of the Roman Empire. In the five centuries since the death of Jesus, Christianity has conquered an empire. Now, that empire has fallen. Will Christianity fall with the empire? How will the faith of Jesus survive the period men have come to call the Dark Ages? The year is 410 AD. The Roman Empire covers most of the known world. Only four centuries ago, a preacher from Galilee was crucified for his beliefs by a Roman governor. Now the religion that bears his name is the official faith of the empire. From slaves to senators, all of Roman society is Christian. The history of this movement is utterly astonishing. We know so little of Jesus of Nazareth, and what we know is very poignant and very powerful, and often rather conflicting. And yet, you know, within 300 years, this becomes the religion of the empire. This story is enormously unlikely. From Africa to Britain, the apostles spread their faith, traveling the straight and steady roads that hold the massive empire together. Their greatest advantage is the very strength and cohesion of Roman civilization. Little do they know that the world's most powerful empire is about to collapse. But in the year 410, the seemingly eternal edifice of the Roman Empire begins to crack and crumble. Wave after wave of barbarian forces descend on the city of Rome. The Roman legions hastily abandon their garrisons in the far reaches of the empire and rush to protect its center, the Eternal City. But they are too late. The Goths sweep through Rome. Stunned citizens watch as the barbarians loot and burn their city, the center of a once invincible empire that stretched from Persia to the Atlantic. Meanwhile, in Britain, northernmost point of the empire, Roman fortifications stand deserted. Without the Roman soldiers to protect them, the citizens are left defenseless to attack from the north. And to the north lies Ireland. Unlike Britain, 5th century Ireland remains unconquered by Rome 
and untouched by Christianity. The Irish are a people rooted in timeless traditions that are at once wild and pastoral. The island is ruled by warrior chieftains engaged in skirmish after skirmish for control of territory and cattle. Famous for their ferocity, Irish warriors go into battle naked except for sandals and a sword. In the fifth century, it is these Irish warriors who cross the channel in their rough but seaworthy boats. They descend upon farms and estates of Britain. After a frenzy of looting, burning, and killing, these raiders sail back to Ireland with captured slaves. Among the loot of one coastal town, is a boy named Patrick, the son of a wealthy British landowner. He is destined for great things. Upon arriving in Ireland, the young Patrick is sold as a slave to one of the island's warrior chieftains. Torn from his family and his life as a privileged Roman citizen, he finds himself alone in the Irish hills, tending sheep. Hunger, cold, and rain are the young shepherd's only companions. Patrick endures the hardships of slavery for six years before God tells him in a dream to run away. Escaping across the Irish Sea, the now devout youth is reunited with his overjoyed parents. But Patrick seems changed, restless, unable to settle down. One night in a dream, he has a vision of the Irish people. They ask him with one voice to return to them and to bring them the word of God. Thus, Patrick's journey to sainthood begins. Patrick studies for 12 years to prepare himself and in 432, he is sent to Ireland as a missionary bishop. This is his long-awaited opportunity to spread the gospel among the Irish. Patrick is not blind to the risk of challenging the gods of the warlike Irish, yet he defies the Druid priest by lighting a forbidden fire high on the hill of Slain to celebrate Easter. Despite these obstacles to converting the Irish, Patrick succeeds where others might have failed, perhaps because he teaches the Irish a Christianity that harmonizes easily with their indigenous religion. The groundwork was, was laid by the Celtic religion of Druidism, which had an emphasis on the sacred number three. The Irish were already used to uh, gods who had three persons. There was an emphasis on immortality, the immortality of the soul, and an emphasis on resurrection and the afterlife in, in the Druidic religion. Patrick also presents to the Irish a benevolent rather than a punishing God, a God who created the world for human beings to enjoy. These beliefs are expressed in an ancient prayer attributed to him. I arise today through the strength of heaven. Light of sun, radiance of moon, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of wind, depth of sea, stability of earth, firmness of rock. Legends about St. Patrick abound. It is said that he used the shamrock to explain the Trinity that he drove the snakes from Ireland. By the time of Patrick's death in 461, Ireland is overwhelmingly Christian. With Patrick now gone, 
What emerges from the Irish landscape is a new society, a society of monks. They are the spiritual heirs of Patrick. Neither they nor Patrick could know that they will preserve the best of classical civilization, not only for Ireland, but for all of Europe. Within a decade of Patrick's mission, there are hundreds of monasteries all over the countryside. In contrast to the European continent, where the bishops of large cities hold authority, in Ireland, it is the abbots of monasteries who preside over religious life. The role of the abbot is not the only unique aspect of Celtic Christianity. Irish priests hear private confessions, while Roman Christians must confess their sins before the entire congregation. The Celtic Church also refuses to legislate private moral and social behavior. One of the ways the faith of the Irish takes flight is reflected in the roles of women. Bridget of Kildare is a powerful leader of the Irish Christian Church. In Ireland, there are, there are female saints like, like Bridget. Uh, Bridget stands out because she is the female equivalent for the Ireland of Patrick. that She's regarded in a special way. Uh, one of her names in the Middle Ages was Mary of the Gael. In other words, uh, the, the Virgin Mary equivalent of the Irish people. This Mary of Ireland would found, build, and supervise an immense monastery housing both nuns and monks. And now, something amazing begins to transpire in the great monastic centers of Ireland. A society that, before Patrick, had relied solely on an oral tradition, now becomes literate under the guidance of Christian missionaries. In a matter of a generation, Irish monks not only read and write, but have become the world's finest scholars of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. The Irish monks had an ethos of study as a, a way of worshiping God work and prayer and study and their work was largely copying you know copying down manuscripts preserving learning as well as augmenting learning so that at the center of every every irish monastic institution there'd be a scriptorium you know, a place for writing and a library a place for study the flowering of irish learning comes not a moment too soon in the chaos of the barbarian invasions, all the great libraries of Western Europe are destroyed. Yet, while the ancient classical civilization is crumbling, Irish monks are devoting themselves to copying and preserving the literature of the vanishing culture. I think it would be safe to say that Every book written before the year 1000 AD that includes all of the Greco-Roman classics, that includes all of Holy Scripture, Old and New Testament, that includes all of the theological works, and the Jewish side from Josephus or from Augustine or anyone else, we would not have these books today if it hadn't been for the manuscript recopying in these monasteries. And so it is that Western history and culture are preserved intact by the hands of a few Irish monks, as the monks of this windswept island toil away at their illuminated manuscripts. Western Europe enters the period that would come to be called the Dark Ages, ushered in by the barbarian invasions and the fall of Rome. But some say Rome does not fall at all. Instead, it moves east, there, among the spires and domes of Constantinople. A new and dazzling Christian empire is rising, Byzantium. The city of Rome falls to the Goths in 476. 
but the city that falls is no longer the center of the empire. That distinction is shifted to the city consecrated by the Emperor Constantine in 330 as the New Rome, the city that bears his name, Constantinople. While the West declined and went into what's called the Dark Ages, Constantinople was a magnificent city. Art, culture, literature, uh, commerce, politics, di diplomacy, the military arts all flourished in the East. It's very important to realize that the eastern half of the Roman Empire did not fall at this time. It's only the west, the areas Adriatic Sea westward, Italy, uh, Gaul, Iberia, that fell. The eastern half continues. However, from here on, historians no longer call this the East Roman Empire. They call it the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine emperors have learned from Rome's mistakes. They construct walls so brilliantly engineered that they will remain unbreached for the next 1,000 years. Walls that still stand today in modern-day Istanbul, monument to the longest-lived empire in Europe's history, Byzantium. Despite the loss of the Western provinces, the Byzantine Empire is still vast. It stretches from the Mediterranean Sea to the Danube River and boasts the most highly centralized government in the world. And Christianity is the mortar which holds together the building blocks of empire. Religion permeates every aspect of Byzantine life. State holidays are Christian holidays. Trade contracts are executed with the sign of the cross. Even the thoroughly Roman chariot races at the Hippodrome begin with the singing of hymns. This stable and unified marriage of church and state is about to come under attack from a force within. For if the church and state are one, then religious disagreements therefore become political disagreements. One universal Christian empire based on the one true faith supported by the one universal Orthodox and Catholic Church. So this was the ideal and if there was disunity among Christians, if errors prevailed within the church, from the emperor's point of view that would damage the stability, the welfare of the whole empire. Religious orthodoxy is a matter of national security, just as important to the defense of the empire as the fabled walls around Constantinople. But while the walls stand firm, the orthodox faith is shaken again and again by the emergence of new ideas. The emperor's duty as Christ's representative, it was his responsibility to maintain the kind of order in the empire as he would think there would be order in heaven. And so his responsibility was to make sure that there was unity, that there was some harmony. But now you had Christians who were fighting one another, who were causing divisions in the empire over church-related things, over theological, Christological issues. Who is Christ? Is he divine? Is he human? These are the questions debated in seven general or ecumenical councils between the years 325 and 787. The first of these councils was convened by Constantine in 325 AD at Nicaea when the bishops created the Christian creed. The emperor summons bishops to respond to a question of faith and theology, to determine whether or not a belief should be considered a heresy. This was true at Nicaea and would be at all subsequent councils. Because church and state are interwoven, heresy is not only believed to imperil the human soul, 
it is equivalent to treason. So important are these councils that the debate spills out into the street. The whole city is full of it. The squares, the marketplaces, old clothes men, money changers, food sellers are all busy arguing. If you ask someone to give you change, he philosophizes about the begotten and the unbegotten. If you inquire about the price of a loaf, you are told by way of reply that the father is greater and the son inferior. Gregory of Nyssa. The most explosive outbreak of theological dissent occurs in Byzantium's eastern provinces. By the fifth century, the vast majority of Syrians, Palestinians, and Egyptians hold divergent beliefs about the nature of Christ. Their opponents call them believers in a single nature, or monophysites. For the monophysites, Christ is fully human and he's fully divine, but his whole nature is divine. For the Orthodox, who are against the monophysites, they're saying, well, if you say that, you are really, in effect, subtracting, although you're not saying so, you're subtracting from the humanity of Christ. We have to have Christ being equally human and equally divine. The monophysites are trying to push it in the direction of Christ being entirely divine. And that's the source of the problem between them. In the year 451, the Emperor Martian calls the Fourth Ecumenical Council to grapple with the monophysite question. Held in the city of Chalcedon, the council sessions are long and bitter. The issue at the Council of Chalcedon is the nature of Christ. It's absolutely essential to get that right, because that is the center of Christianity. Ultimately, the council reaffirms the Orthodox creed, articulated a century earlier at the first Council of Nicaea. We all, with one voice, teach men to confess that the Son and our Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same, that he is perfect in Godhead and perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. Decree of the Council of Chalcedon. Monophysite writings and bishops are condemned, but the bishops of the eastern provinces stand firm in their beliefs. They reject the edict of Chalcedon and they pay a heavy price for their dissension. In Syria and Palestine, priests and monks are drawn into the desert, their churches and monasteries burning behind them. Some even die defending their beliefs. Alexandria, the capital of Monophysite Egypt. Thousands of religious refugees pour in from Syria and Palestine. Imperial soldiers follow to enforce the Orthodox creed laid down at Chalcedon. In this atmosphere of unrest and confusion, a young woman arrives in Alexandria, hoping to change her life. She is penniless and alone. Her name is Theodora and she is about to become the most powerful woman in the world. Constantinople's most popular entertainment, the spectacle of the Hippodrome. Everyone is in attendance, even the priests. A secret passageway connects the Imperial Palace to the stadium. From a private royal box, the Empress and Emperor enjoy the races. They have in readiness two big chariots embellished with gold. To each chariot, four horses are harnessed, and in them, Two men take their places, dressed in clothes woven of gold. They let the horses go, urging them on. The winner is laden with riches.
This is where Theodora grows up, in the circus-like atmosphere of the Hippodrome. Her mother is an acrobat. Her father, a bear handler. Theodora is very young when her father dies, leaving her to scramble for food among the petty criminals, stable boys, and sideshow freaks of the stadium. According to the 6th century historian Procopius, Theodora follows her older sister onto the bawdy stage of the era. There, she becomes infamous for her erotic parodies of Roman myths, an unusual beginning for someone on the threshold of destiny. Like most other actresses of the day, Theodora may be supplementing her income with prostitution. At age 20, Theodora becomes the mistress of a provincial governor she travels with him to Africa, where he abandons her. Alone and penniless, she makes her way to Alexandria. As with so many great leaders of the church, she is about to undergo a radical transformation of the spirit. Whatever records we have through Procopius and others, the idea that something happened to this beautiful, I understand she was red-haired, a beauty, magnificent-looking woman. Something happened to her in Alexandria where she had a spiritual experience of some kind, some kind of transforming conversion experience. Theodora's transformation comes at the feet of Timothy, the revered Monophysite patriarch of Alexandria. For the rest of her life, she will refer to him as her spiritual father. She will also emerge as a formidable champion of Timothy's persecuted church. After her conversion, Theodora returns home to Constantinople. She takes simple quarters and makes her living spinning wool. She does not know that an extraordinary fate awaits her. At the age of 22, Theodora meets Justinian, the nephew of the reigning emperor and heir to the throne. No one knows just how the immortal couple met, but meet they did. Theodora was about to go from a woman of the streets to the most powerful woman on earth. Justinian falls helplessly in love with her but can't marry her because senators were not allowed to marry actresses. And so, before he became emperor, Justinian got his uncle, who was emperor at the time, to have the law rescinded. And now senators could marry actresses, and he married Theodora. In 527 AD, in the Hagia Sophia, Christianity's greatest church, the two are crowned emperor and empress of Byzantium. As the elaborate religious ceremony ends, trumpets and heralds announce the royal couple to the cheering throngs outside the church. Bedecked in jewels and purple robes, the royal couple are drawn through the streets in a golden coach. Their destination, the Hippodrome. Appearing in the royal box, Justinian steps forward to bless the crowd. He makes the sign of the cross with one hand and holds Theodora's hand with the other. As the crowd roars its approval, Theodora looks down on the place where she grew up in poverty. I think Theodora was probably surprised more than anyone else to see herself in this situation. She rose from the life of prostitution to a life of repentance and now sitting on the imperial throne. But she had felt that she had been put there in order to fulfill God's purpose. Throughout his reign, Justinian will rely heavily on Theodora. 
her hard-worn instincts for survival will serve him well. Let me tell you, despite this rocky origin, Theodora turns out to be a first-class empress. Today, I would compare her to Eva Perón in terms of being uh, the power behind the throne. Theodora is now in a position to help the Monophysites, whose kindness she has never forgotten. Under the protection of the Empress, Monophysite fortunes improve dramatically. Exiled bishops come back to their churches, where they are cheered as returning heroes. Theodora maneuvers to advance Monophysite bishops to positions of power in the church. Her greatest coup is when Antimus, a saintly Monophysite bishop, is installed as the Patriarch of Constantinople, a position second only to that of the Bishop of Rome. Timothy and other Monophysite thinkers are invited to the Imperial Palace to discuss theology with Justinian. He never became a believer himself in one nature, but he did everything he could to mollify the one nature Monophysite believers uh, for her sake. He obviously loved her and he obviously appreciated her views. While Theodora pursues her religious campaign, Justinian works to realize his lifelong dream to rule an empire of unprecedented glory. In the year 537, he completes the rebuilding of the Hagia Sophia. Striding under the great dome which seems to float in midair, Justinian sees himself as heir to the biblical king who built the glorious first temple of Jerusalem. Raising his arms to heaven, the emperor announces, Solomon, Solomon, I have outdone thee. Not only does Justinian sponsor great public works, he orders the codification of Roman law. His corpus juris civilis is a landmark of legal history. And Justinian embarks on a great campaign to reconquer the western provinces lost to the barbarians and return the empire to its former glory. Despite ongoing wars with Persia on his eastern border, Justinian marches his armies west. They achieve breathtaking success, reconquering Africa, then crossing the Mediterranean to take Spain. By 540, the Byzantine army has entered Ravenna, the Western Empire's capital in exile. Justinian has fulfilled his imperial dreams. He now turns his attention to the deepening divide in the church. At issue is the same question that divided the Council of Chalcedon, a raging debate on the divine nature of Christ. Justinian attempts to assert his political power to reunite the Orthodox and the Monophysites. In 533, Justinian calls the Fifth Ecumenical Council he informs the gathered bishops that he expects them to resolve their differences, but this reconciliation is not to be. The Orthodox faction prevails, and the Fifth Council reaffirms the Edict of Chalcedon to the dismay of both the Monophysites and Justinian himself. Some of those councils actually cause more division than unity. In hindsight, as we scholars look back on this period, we understand now that there was more terminological difference than there was actual substantive differences between the two churches. In the aftermath, the Bishop of Rome makes a rare visit to Constantinople. He reminds Justinian of the emperor's responsibility to uphold the Orthodox faith. 
The Pope tells the Emperor, look, you must abide by the teachings of the Council of Chalcedon, which was the ecumenical council, everybody agrees on it. You can't go off and start making concessions to the Monophysites. You have to toe the line. Even with all of their power, Justinian and Theodora are not able to unite the church. On June 28, 548, Theodora dies of cancer. Justinian reigns alone until his death in 565. He would never recover from the loss of his beloved Theodora. Without Theodora's imperial influence, the Monophysites once again suffer persecution. And without Justinian's strong leadership, the Western provinces slowly slip back under barbarian control. As the West falls back under the sway of barbarian tribes, something new rises in the East. It is a religious movement so militant and so powerful that it will overrun many of the major centers of Christianity. In fact, this new religion called Islam or submission will even seize control of the land where Christianity itself first began. It is now a hundred years after the reign of Justinian, and the Christian world remains hopelessly divided over its beliefs. The year is 610 AD, 800 miles south of the Byzantine frontier. In the middle of the Arabian desert, outside the Christian empire, a piercingly simple cry is heard a cry that will change Christianity forever. There is no God but God. The cry comes from a 40-year-old man named Muhammad. Yearning for something beyond the pagan traditions of his people, Muhammad wanders the hills above Mecca. Then, one lonely night, he hears a voice he cannot ignore. Proclaim in the name of thy Lord and Cherisher. Proclaim, for thy Lord is most bountiful, who has taught men what he knew not before. Quran 96, 1 through 5. It is the voice of Allah, the creator of the universe. Muhammad longs to proclaim that Allah is the one and only God, but he fears he will be thought mad by his tribesmen the richest Arab merchants of Mecca. Muhammad confides his vision only to his wife, Hadija. She reassures him, he is not a madman. He is nothing less than a prophet. You are he of whom I bear witness. There is no God but God, and you are his chosen apostle. With his wife as his first disciple, Muhammad begins to preach to the people of Mecca. He proclaims his revelations in verse, and it is these verses that will be known as the Quran, the holy book of Islam. And so it is that in the vast deserts of Arabia, Islam is born. What began as a small group of devoted followers of Muhammad is today a religion that includes one in five people on earth. For Christianity, it will be a force to be reckoned with. At first, the monotheistic faith of Muhammad does not appear threatening to Christianity. Muhammad asserts that the Hebrew Bible is the basis for his new beliefs. In the Quran, Muhammad is proclaimed as a prophet in the tradition of Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. The stories of the Islamic holy book recall the familiar stories of Exodus and the virgin birth of Jesus. Yet in the Quran, Jesus is a prophet, not the Messiah, and he escapes the crucifixion. 
Islam does in fact pose a serious challenge to Christendom. The armies of Islam are about to shake the Christian world to its core. The story begins in the year 622. Persecuted by his own tribesmen, Muhammad and his followers are forced to flee from Mecca to the nearby city of Medina. This transforming journey, known as the Hijra, is so central to Muslim history that it marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar. Within 10 years of the Hijra, Muhammad converts most of the Bedouin tribes of Arabia by the sword. And although the prophet dies in the year 632, within a mere 20 years after his death, his heirs succeed in gathering together the entire Arab world under the cloak of Islam. Byzantium fails to take note of the Arabian giant rising from the sands of the desert. Islam is one of the most important events in the history of Christianity because what the Muslims do is conquer the economically richest areas and geographically richest areas of Christianity. They conquer the centers of uh, Christian learning. Only Constantinople and Rome are left. So it really is a, a, a frontal assault on Christianity. The Islamic assault is actually seen as liberation by many of the Christian communities of Arabia. After two centuries of persecution by their Orthodox brethren, the Monophysite Christians of Egypt and Syria put up only token resistance when the Arabs arrive at their gates. Ironically, the Monophysites experience religious freedom for the first time under their new Muslim masters. In fact, the Christian communities of Egypt survive to this day retaining a separate identity as the Coptic Church. As the Islamic conquests sweep over North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia Minor, the Byzantine Empire seems helpless to stop their onslaught. As he watches his dominions fall away, the newly crowned emperor, Leo VI, searches for answers he seizes upon the notion that his imperial misfortunes are due not to strategic problems, but to spiritual deviation. The emperor comes to believe that the Islamic conquest is God's retribution for the blasphemous worship of icons, images of Jesus, Mary, and the other saints. The icons have long been staples of Byzantine religious life. But now the emperor convinces himself that the worshiper before an icon is actually bowing to wood and paint and is therefore guilty of the sin of idolatry. Why are the Christians suffering defeat at the hands of the pagans? It seems to me it is because the icons are worshiped and nothing else. And for this reason, I intend to destroy them. Leo the Sixth. Why should this have happened in a society where veneration of icons was at the center of, of liturgical practice? First of all, there's the influence of Islam, and the Muslims have a very strong prohibition against uh, icons. The iconoclasts sort of are reminded by the Muslims of the Old Testament prohibition against images. So they're saying, well, wait a minute, you can't, you, if Christ really is God as we believe, and you're making this picture of Christ, aren't you violating the uh, commandment not to make an image of God? Leo outlaws the worship of icons. He sends troops to destroy them in churches throughout the empire. The reaction within the Christian community is swift and passionate. Some of the faithful even die as martyrs to protect their beloved icons. 
Like earlier theological crises, the controversy over icons is finally resolved in an ecumenical council held in 787. The Seventh Ecumenical Council said it is possible to make an icon of Christ because he had a real human soul and a real human body. It is one of the characteristics of being human that we can be portrayed and depicted. While the Council officially resolves the theological debate over icons, it also demonstrates a widening division between East and West. For the Western Church and the Pope have made enemies in their acrimonious defense of icons. And this division will become a geographical fact as the ever-advancing armies of Islam drive a wedge between East and West. The two halves of the Christian world will be permanently cut off from one another. The spread of Islamic conquest will be halted only at the gateway to what is now France. And 732 AD at the Battle of Poitiers, the Frankish King Charles Martel will stop the onslaught and drive the Arab armies back to the Pyrenees. In doing so, Charles sets the stage for a new Christian empire in the West to be ruled by his grandson. Like Constantine and Justinian before him, this leader will be hailed as emperor, but with a new addition to the title, the Holy Roman Emperor. History will remember him as Charles the Great, Charlemagne. In Charlemagne's hands will lie the future of Christianity, whether it will thrive again or fall forever under the cloak of Islam. In other dark ages are upon Europe, the years between the fall of Rome and the rise of Islam have not been good to Christianity. From the north, barbarians have burned the last remnants of the Roman Empire. From the south and east, Muslim armies have conquered the great cities of Christendom. And from within, feuds have torn apart anything resembling church unity. Into this chaos comes now a figure who will be hailed as one of the great champions of Christianity, Charlemagne, Charles the Great, King of the Franks. It is Charlemagne who will rescue the Christian faith. Charlemagne, who will begin to usher out the first thousand years of the religion born with Jesus and begin to usher in a bold new millennium for Christianity. The year is 799. A small band of frightened men makes its way over treacherous Alpine passes. Among them is Pope Leo III, and his enemies are close behind him. For this pope is escaping a terrible fate. Rivals have attacked him, intending to blind him and cut out his tongue, mutilating him so horribly that he would not be able to continue as pope. Wounded about the face and eyes, Leo is fleeing to seek the assistance of the most powerful man in the West, Charlemagne, King of the Franks. With each step Pope Leo takes towards Charlemagne's court in the West, a part of Christian history moves away from Imperial Byzantium in the East, the center of the faith for the last 400 years.
Not only will Leo's appeal to Charlemagne change the fate of Christianity, it will change the face of Europe itself. The story of Pope Leo's flight across the Alps and the road to a new Christian empire actually begins four centuries back in the rubble of Western Rome. When Rome fell 400 years earlier, so did its political institutions. And as the state fell, the church began to rise. At this time, the church becomes the only remaining source of unity. Its monasteries and missionaries spread out to the furthest reaches of what once was the Western Roman Empire. And now, too, the power of the Pope, then known as the Bishop of Rome, begins to expand. The Eastern Church in Constantinople looks uneasily upon the rise of papal power in the West. For the Bishop of Rome states that he, as the direct successor of Peter, is the true leader of all Christendom, not just in the West, but in the East as well. According to Rome, this authority stems from none other than Jesus himself when he declared Peter the leader of all the apostles. Jesus said unto him, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and whoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Matthew 16:18. It is a clear challenge to the power of the Eastern Church, as if a gauntlet has been thrown. What's happening is that the uh, Pope in Rome is seeking autonomy and emancipation, uh, political emancipation from the Emperor of Constantinople, the Byzantine Emperor. What you have already in the 8th century is the beginning of a schism you know, that takes place not on the religious level, but on the political level. The Western Church is going to go off and create its own political center of gravity over against the uh, Eastern Church. But power has its price. Now that the papal treasury is bulging with the monies of Western Christendom, the chair of St. Peter has become a coveted and viciously contested prize. The noble families of Rome begin to vie with each other to place a candidate in the chair of St. Peter. Rival factions make and unmake popes. At times, there are even two men who claim the title of Pope. Popes are arrested and tortured by political enemies. One Pope is even dug up from his grave by his successor so that his corpse can be propped up to stand trial for his alleged crimes. So it is that Pope Leo III finds himself fleeing across the windswept Alps. He has narrowly escaped mutilation and now desperately makes for sanctuary with a king called Charlemagne. Charlemagne, born in 742, he is crowned the ruler of the Frankish kingdom at the age of 26. As king, he will come to be called Charles the Great, in French, Charles Le Main. The 26-year-old Charlemagne inherits a vast domain, 
stretching from Marseille to Cologne. But he will not rest on his inheritance, for this is a complex man, a strong believer in moderation and family values. And yet he is so possessive of his daughters, he never lets them marry. A fierce warrior who is driven by power and the devout Christian faith. What helps earn the young king the title of Charles the Great is that his military campaigns include not only the conquest of territory, but a spreading of the faith. It is to this man, this king, that Pope Leo III comes seeking sanctuary and finds it. In December of the year 800, Pope Leo III joins Charlemagne at the head of an army marching into Rome. For Leo, it is a triumphant return as Charlemagne settles the charges against him and restores him to his rightful place as Pope. On Christmas Day, Charlemagne kneels before the high altar at the Basilica of St. Peter to give thanks for his victory. 800 years after Jesus spread the word in the hills of Galilee, a new Christian empire is about to rise from the dark ages of Europe. It is Christmas Day in Rome in the year 800. A Latin chant echoes in the vaults of St. Peter's Cathedral calling in a new era. It is the first time in more than 300 years that an attempt is being made to restore the Roman Empire by crowning a new emperor. Carollo Piissimo Augusto Adeo Coronato crowned by God, mighty and pacific emperor, to him be life and victory. As so often occurs in history, what is essential in this moment remains invisible to the eye. Pope Leo, who is crowning the new emperor, fled from this city barely one year earlier to seek the protection of the very man he is now crowning, Charlemagne. And so it is that this coronation marks the new dawn of a struggle for power between church and state. You see, Charlemagne may have wanted to be crowned uh, emperor, but he may not have wanted the pope to do it. So the pope, uh, Pope Leo, may have, uh, may have known that Charlemagne was going to get the crown and thought, how do I establish my um, symbolic authority over the king, I'll go in and crown him uh, before he's expecting it, and that way it's clear that I have placed the crown upon his head. However, in Charlemagne's mind, it is he who has ultimate authority of church and state. And so, an uneasy alliance is born between Pope Leo and Charlemagne, which masks a struggle for power between church and state. It is a struggle that will continue through the first millennium of Christianity and beyond. But the political waters run deeper here, for the coronation of Charlemagne also heralds the renewal of another struggle, a struggle not only of power, but of faith. For when news of the coronation reaches Constantinople, a line is firmly drawn 
between East and West. In Byzantine political theory, the emperor is the icon of God on earth, the living image of God. As God rules in heaven, so the emperor rules on earth. Now, a, co a consequence of this is there is only one God in heaven, so there can only be one emperor on earth. The Byzantines, when Charlemagne declared himself Holy Roman Emperor, had himself crowned as such in Rome, saw this as an act of schism. There couldn't be two co-equal emperors on the Byzantine theory. In Rome, the potential strife between East and West and the potential strife between church and state is put aside for the moment as Charlemagne and Pope Leo pursue their common vision to unite Europe under Christ. The idea was you established a united Christendom, at least in the western part of Europe, with the Pope and the Emperor uh, ruling it together, ruling it in cooperation. In Charlemagne's mind, the Emperor would be a little bit more important than the Pope, but the Emperor and the Pope would work together and they would unite all of the uh, Christian kingdoms of the West and then they would convert the pagan kingdoms too and bring them into this united uh, Christian Europe. Charlemagne's campaign to unite Europe in the name of Christ sweeps across Europe, then hits a stumbling block in northwestern Germany. This is the land of the pagan Saxons. When Charlemagne defeats them and moves on, the Saxons murder the Christian missionaries left behind. And so it goes, year after year. Rallied by their leader, Wittikun, the German Saxons remain with their paganism in defiance of Charlemagne. Charlemagne now employs a scorched earth policy to break the Saxons of their pagan ways. He marches an army from one end of Saxony to the other, burning fields, destroying villages, and forcibly relocating much of the population. Charlemagne's campaign proves persuasive. The surviving Saxons undergo mass conversion to the religion of their conquerors. Even Vidicun, the once defiant rebel chief, is baptized, with Charlemagne himself standing in as godfather. Twenty years of unending warfare have given Charlemagne a unified Christian empire that stretches across much of Europe. He now sets out to provide his people with a more complete understanding of Christianity. Charlemagne took his role as head of the French church very seriously. For example, he went out across the country and heard some of the sermons being delivered by some of the peasant preachers and he was very much disillusioned. And so what he did was to have sermons prepared a week ahead of time and would pass these out in the countryside. Not satisfied with merely preparing sermons for the masses, Charlemagne also establishes a center of learning for the clergy. It is the court school at Aachen, located to the west of what is now Bonn, modern-day Germany's capital city. The idea was to establish a central place for the training of bishops. For Charlemagne and his advisors, it was extremely important to have bishops throughout the empire who knew their theology, who could preach to the people, 
who could help establish Christian ideas. And the, the school under Charlene did succeed in, in training very able clergy who then went on to be bishops and who set up schools uh, throughout the empire. Oddly enough, Charlemagne himself is lacking in a thorough formal education. And yet this highly religious warrior emperor manages to launch a renaissance that bears his name, the Carolingian Renaissance. It is born more than 500 years before another renaissance is to emerge in Italy. The court school is led by a monk who inherits centuries of Irish monastic learning. His name is Alcuin of York. At the school, Alcuin presides over the scriptorium, which employs 40 scribes in copying manuscripts. So successful is this scriptorium that 90% of the literary works from antiquity, which we have today, come to us from the manuscripts produced here in this school, begun by Charlemagne. But life, like glory, is fleeting, and even emperors do not live forever. Strong succession is needed, but not always provided for by powerful men. In the year 813, the 70-year-old Charlemagne appoints Louis, his only surviving son, and not a powerful personality in his own right, as his co-emperor. The power shared by church and state remains in delicate balance. For the coronation of his son Louis, Charlemagne sees to it that the Pope is not invited to participate in the ceremony. Despite his declining health, Charlemagne spends the winter hunting. But on January 28th of 814, the old man loses his final battle. In The Life of Charlemagne, the writer Einhard tells how a saddened and grateful empire buries its leader. His body was carried to the church amid the greatest lamentation of all the people. He was buried there the same day that he died, and a gilded arch was erected above his tomb with this inscription, In this tomb lies the body of Charles the Great and Orthodox Emperor, who gloriously extended the kingdom of the Franks and reigned prosperously for 47 years. Perhaps Charlemagne's greatest triumph is that he has kept Europe intact and in peace for most of his lifetime. And perhaps it is his greatest tragedy that he did not provide sufficiently for the ongoing peace and security of the empire he left behind. As happened with invading Celtic warriors a few centuries earlier, a new threat now comes from out of the north. This time, amid the gilded dragon tails of approaching Viking ships, the united Christian empire that Charlemagne has just left behind to an ill-prepared son and his government is already attracting predators. It is the early ninth century. The faith of Jesus has spread far beyond its roots in the Holy Land, to Byzantium in Asia Minor, and to most of Europe beyond. It is a peaceful, united, Christian Europe that Charlemagne has just left behind as a legacy. 
In the uneasy human family, peace is often a thin cloak which hides the apparition of war. The first warning would have come from the northern horizon. Perhaps it was the flash of light on a bright sail or the sound of hundreds of chanting warriors, their oars breaking the water in ominous rhythm. They came from the sea, heathens. They plundered and they murdered. Some of the brothers were carried off. Blood flew in the altar. Christians were trampled underfoot like filth in the streets. English Mark, 793 AD. The longboats are first spotted off the coast of Ireland in the late 8th century. They are lethal warriors called Vikings, a pagan people from what is now called Scandinavia. War with the Vikings is war by terror. For the Vikings do not fight as ordinary armies, but with sudden strikes, isolated raids by separate bands. And it is not just people they destroy, but cultures too. The first land in their way is the Scottish island of Iona, where the Vikings lay waste to the site of the country's first Christian monastery. The chronicles are full of the slaughter that the Vikings make and the attacks on monasteries. Enemy. So when the Vikings come, they're just ripe for the picking. The scholarship of Celtic Christianity. The Vikings single out churches for attack because they are often the wealthiest and least defended locations. Like the plagues that descend upon Europe from time to time, the Vikings come on inexorably. Their shallow hulled longboats take them up the rivers of Europe and deep into Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire. At this dark hour, there is no one strong enough to stop them. Charlemagne's son Louis has left the empire to three competing sons, each unhappy with his inheritance. They have weakened the empire with their infighting. Taking advantage of this disarray, the Vikings attack Paris on a frozen Easter day in 845. They raided, laid waste, and met no resistance. Christians were struck down without mercy outside the monastery at Saint-Denis. The church of Saint-Germain was plundered. When they went, they took many Christians as prisoners. God save us from the wild Norsemen who ravage our kingdom. Christian Chronicle, 845 AD. Viking ships make their way around Spain and into the Mediterranean, attacking Cordoba, Pisa, and Milan. To some Christians in Europe, it must have seemed as if the bloody Viking triumphs are nothing less than God's abandonment. But as so often happens in the darkest of times, many Christians now find faith. a faith found in the heart, if not yet in the evidence. For this dark ninth century also sees a bright renewal in belief, belief in the power of relics, belief in the power of saints, and as would happen once again a thousand years later, belief in the comfort of a loving mother. After all, the Christian tradition has from its beginning was almost entirely a male tradition. So there had to be a female presence in it someplace, a powerful female presence. And so Mary, the mother of Jesus, became that presence. But even mothers cannot always protect their children. And just as it seems that a Europe invaded by Vikings can get no darker, a new enemy thunders out of the steppes of Asia, a tribe of horsemen called the Magyar. 
In the year 896, the Magyars descend on Central Europe with unparalleled fury. The Magyars, thirsting for murder and eager for the fray, fell upon the Christians while they were still yawning with sleep. Some indeed were awakened by arrow points before they heard the cries of battle. German Bishop, 907 AD. The pagan Magyars seemed disdainful of Christianity. They burned churches and monasteries in every town they attacked. To the invaded population, this feels like an assault on Christianity itself, or perhaps the beginning of the end of the world. See and know and understand this. The end of this world is very near. Many calamities have appeared, and men's crimes and woes are greatly multiplied. From day to day, we hear of monstrous plagues and strange death throughout the country. Nation riseth against nation. We see wars caused by iniquitous deeds. The Almighty will bring this world to an end. 10th Bickling Homily. 797 AD. This violent apocalyptic imagery is inspired by the book of Revelation. Surely now, as pagan hordes overrun Christendom and the year 1000 approaches, surely now, doomsday is at hand. Some scholars believe that few in the population share in this feeling of impending doom. Perhaps because the people of mostly peasant rural Europe did not know that they were approaching the end of a millennium. There was really no widespread understanding that we were approaching the year 1000 uh, because calendars differed uh, all over Europe and the greater part of the population would really have not uh, known what year they were living in. Whatever the people of Europe may have believed, their reality is indisputable. Coastal regions from Ireland to Italy face deadly raids from Vikings and Central Europe from Magyar horsemen. The Pope in Rome holds little power, and the Emperor in Constantinople is but a figurehead. The United Christian Kingdom, which once was under Charlemagne, is now in mortal peril of being scattered to the four winds. The waning hours of August 10th, 955 AD, Lech fell south of the River Danube in Central Europe. 25,000 Christian Frankish soldiers searched their hearts for courage in the vanishing light. They face a line of pagan Magyar cavalry, which outnumbers them almost two to one. To the Franks, the Magyars must seem like the very horsemen of the apocalypse. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And he was given a great sword. Revelation 6, 4. The pagan Magyar horsemen believe the battle with the Christian Franks is already won. There is no one like us. The earth will not open up to swallow us. The sky will not collapse to crush us. We cannot be stopped, Magyar boast. Otto, king of the outnumbered Franks, is a descendant of the warlords conquered by Charlemagne and converted to Christianity. 
the 40,000 Magyar warriors before him, are the final obstacle to Otto's dream of a reunited Holy Roman Empire. And Otto is not afraid, for in his hands he holds a lance studded with a nail from the cross on which Christ died. He tells his men this holy lance assures them of victory. We are outnumbered, I know, but not in bravery. What is our great solace? Our enemy is stripped of the help of God. For them, there is boldness alone. For us, there is divine protection. Otto the Great, 955 AD. Otto gives the order to charge. The 25,000 Frankish knights clash head on with the 40,000 Magyar horsemen in a brutal battle of lance, shield, and sword. Otto's faith is not misplaced. His badly outnumbered troops crush the Magyar cavalry. The Franks now seek revenge for 50 years of Magyar abuse. Legend has it that only seven mutilated Magyars out of 40,000 soldiers are allowed to live and only so that they may bring the tale back to their people in what today is Hungary. Otto rides triumphant into Rome, just as Charlemagne did two generations before him. He kneels at the altar of St. Peter's Cathedral and is crowned by the Pope as the new Holy Roman Emperor, Otto the Great. But Otto, the devout Christian warrior who once held a holy lance in the battle against the Magyars, soon becomes disillusioned with the Pope. For this Pope, installed on the papal throne by his Roman family when he was 18, is John XII, a wild young man with a taste for women. In fact, it is said that female pilgrims are afraid to enter St. Peter's. Women fear to come and pray at the threshold of the holy apostles, for they have heard how John, a little time ago, took women pilgrims by force to his bed, wives, widows, and virgins alike. Report to Otto I. Pope John XII would die in the arms of one of his concubines and leave nothing but trouble behind. He took the money of St. Peter's and gave it to his illegitimate children. He let the churches of Rome fall into disrepair, and as the churches decayed, so did the papacy. But John's successor would not be much better. This was the Roman church in the 10th century. The state fares better than the church. Otto the Great dies in 974 and leaves the empire to his son, Otto II. Like his father, he is also passionately involved in the affairs of the church. In fact, by seeing something others could not see, Otto II will help restore the church to its eminence. For Otto is able to look beyond the modest exterior of a scholarly monk and see the greatness within, the greatness of a future pope. Thin and balding with a sculpted goatee, this modest monk named Gerbert is a small man, but beneath his smallness of size is a mind that comes along only once in a generation. Gerbert, a Christian, received much of his education in Islamic Spain, 
Spain is where he studies algebra, astronomy, medicine, and poetry. Eventually, this quiet and brilliant man will develop a steam-powered church organ and invent the world's first pendulum clock. In Rome, Otto II summons Gebert to serve as tutor to his infant son, who is heir to the throne. The young boy grows to manhood and becomes the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III. It is this Otto that turns to Gebert, his childhood tutor. In the year 999 AD, at the age of 58, Gebert, the once shy and retiring monk, is made Pope. As if destiny itself is calling him, Gebert carefully selects his papal name, Sylvester II. Six hundred years earlier in the fourth century, Pope Sylvester I, together with Constantine, had helped establish the model for the imperial church. Now, the second Sylvester, together with Emperor Otto III, will help restore the dignity and honor of the papacy and revive the one great dream of the Holy Roman Empire, a Europe united in Christ. For the, really for the first time since the coronation of Charlemagne in 800, the ideals of Charlemagne begin to get realized. We have for the first time in more than two centuries, the development of a very powerful papacy, a series of very important and powerful popes, and at the same time, a series of very important and powerful emperors. So now we have the possibility of putting that great Christian empire together. Under the guiding hand of Sylvester II, the last pagan countries of Europe are folded into the Christian empire. On Palm Sunday, 999, just 44 years after the Magyars were defeated at Lechfeld by Otto III's grandfather, Sylvester presents a Christian crown to the Magyar warlord king, Stephen of Hungary. Poland soon follows, and suddenly, at the turn of the first millennium, it seems all of Europe turns Christian. By the year 1000, even the Vikings of Denmark, Norway, and Iceland come within the fold of the church. In Byzantium to the east, Christianity also makes stunning progress as the first millennium draws to a close. In the year 926, the Bulgarians convert under the authority of the Eastern Church. In 974, it is the Serbians. And in 988, Vladimir, the Prince of Kiev, is baptized. The entire Russian people are converted at the same time. The year 1000 approaches, and all of Europe and Russia have converted to Christianity. The message of Jesus has been proclaimed far and wide. To some it feels as if God's kingdom on earth is soon to be established, just as some will feel it at the close of the second millennium and beyond. Now, at the end of the first millennium, it is not to be. Christendom, it would seem, has conquered its last threats, but two age-old conflicts remain. 
First, the long simmering conflict between West and East, Rome and Byzantium, comes to a head as the leaders of each church excommunicate each other when reconciliation cannot be reached. It is a split which remains to this day. The winds of power would also continue to affect Christianity. In 1077, a scene plays itself out in the snows of northern Italy at Canossa, a scene that echoes the struggles of the first millennium between church and state and foreshadows things yet to come. It is a standoff between pope and emperor, a standoff which takes place barely 250 years after another pope fled for his life to the safety of the court of another emperor named Charlemagne. Now, Pope Gregory VII and Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV have reached a standoff over who has the ultimate right to appoint ecclesiastical bishops. Pope Gregory makes a daring gamble. He excommunicates Henry, the most powerful monarch in the Western world, for interfering with the freedom of the church. Henry realizes that he is outdone. For three January days, the monarch kneels barefoot in the snow outside the Pope's castle. In the coarse woolen tunic of a repentant sinner, he begs forgiveness to save his immortal soul. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark 8.36. When we speak of the church, especially the church, we're speaking of something that happened, something that's happening, and something that is about to happen. So there's a dynamism there, there's life. And through all of the marble and all of the glitter and all of the mosaics and all the wonderful things that we still have today, the church is alive and Jesus Christ still reigns and he ultimately is the head of the church. And so it was that the teachings of a long ago wandering preacher in Galilee would become the focal point for a thousand years of ongoing struggles for power and ongoing struggles to find faith and meaning in a seemingly random world. Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they are? Matthew 6.26 